scripture reading today will be from the book of Corinthians. I'm sorry, not Corinthians, Romans, chapter 13. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And this morning I'll be reading out of the NIV. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Starting in verse 1. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do this will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear? of one in authority, then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one who is in authority is God's servant for you, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear, bear sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as matter of conscience. This, also, this is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who gave their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Thank you. Morning, everyone. There we go. So, I found out, much to my chagrin, that my children and my co-workers think that I bear a striking, striking resemblance to Brian Cranston on the TV show Breaking Bad. Uh, just in case you were wondering, uh, I do not cook meth and I do not sell drugs, just in case you were wondering. Uh, before I begin, I want to tell a little story, and this story is about a church. You might have heard this story. It involves a, a church that uh, is down south, and there's a railroad track right next to the church, and about every Sunday, about, oh, 10 minutes to 11 before, right before services, there's a freight train that usually comes through there on Sunday. Well, there was an old gentleman, older than me. Uh, that went to services there, a good, faithful Christian. But he had a problem, and that is he used to fall asleep during services. And, uh, of course, this went on for a long time, you know, and the elders finally decided that they were going to bring the guy in and talk to him because they felt it wasn't right and maybe it was causing a disturbance. So they brought the old man in, and they said, uh, we would really like it. If you could do anything possible, anything you can think of, to stay awake during services. And, of course, the old gentleman respecting their authority and uh, wanting to please them and to do what they asked, said, okay, I will do whatever it takes to stay awake during services. Well, next Sunday comes around, and right before services, they look out, about 15, 20 minutes before services, they look out, and some of the people notice that the old man is parked on the railroad tracks in his car. And so some of the members go out there, and of course, there's no small disturbance, you know. People are very excited, and uh, they should be, and they're trying to get him off the railroad tracks, and he's shaking his head, he's not moving. And so the preacher goes out there, and he tries to get the old man to move his car off the railroad tracks, and the guy's shaking his head no. And so the preacher begins to 
talked to him about the fiery consequences, not only of the wreck of the train coming that's going to hit his car, but also the eternal consequences of what he's doing. And I, the, the preacher was just on fire. I mean, he was very excited. And pretty soon, there's a whistle comes. And we see the freight. They, she saw the freight train coming down the road or down the tracks. And so the old man started up his car and drove off the railroad tracks and drove into the parking lot of the church. Well, this, of course, upset the elders pretty good. They were, they were not happy about this. So they called the old gentleman in and they said, uh, why, why did you do that? I mean, don't, don't you know what this did? And the old guy said, well, I'm just doing what you asked me to do. And they said, well, how is that? He said, well, there's three reasons. And uh, he said, okay, you asked me not to fall asleep. So when I parked on that track and everybody got excited, my adrenaline was going so good. I mean, it was a very exciting time for me and for everybody. And, and then he said, and number two, when that preacher came out and he preached that lesson, I'll tell you something. I was on the edge of my seat, and that was the best lesson I'd heard from that preacher in years. And, and they said, and the third reason? And he said, well, with that, with that railroad train coming down the track, going down at me, there's no way I'm falling asleep. So before we get into the lesson, uh, there's something that Jesus said. It's not, the, it's not the well that need a physician, it's the sick. So remember that as we go through this lesson. One of the things that has happened in society that we've seen a lot of lately is the adverse effect of society in the United States uh, to, uh, risk to authority. Uh, the respect and the obligation to subject oneself to authority in a proper way has been compromised. Uh, some think it's understandable or even commendable to question someone's authority, to challenge it, or even to oppose it. Uh, oftentimes in the media and among politicians, we're told we need to pick a side, right or left. And let's face it, as we look out and we turn on our television sets and we see what's going on in the news, uh, sometimes justice is not served by those who are in power. We've all heard of the corrupt cop or the corrupt politician. And when we see this, uh, we're, it, and we see that people aren't looking out necessarily for our best interest. People, especially younger people, see this, and in the void of an authority they can trust, and what, in my opinion, what I'm seeing, is that they go out and try to establish their own authority. And so we see them firebombing the federal buildings. We see them looting and rioting, uh, acts of vengeance conspiracy theories which further the and lead to further suspicion and mistrust. But all that's in the world. It's not in the church or in the in God's kingdom. However, it can affect our attitude in the way we view religion and the authorities of not only religious leaders, but the scriptures themselves. And we must not allow these outside influences to affect our faith and the proper way that we view authority both in the world and in the church. There are many places in the Bible that we can read about how uh, Christians and other people faced uh, and acted in the face of authority of the world. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 through 7, as we read, It's really small, and I'm not going to go ahead and read it again. But we did read that we're supposed to, as Christians, subject ourselves to the authorities because they're put there by God. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 17 through 21, uh, when Christ was uh, challenged, because, you know, the Jews didn't like the Romans. They didn't like them in their country. They thought they... Uh, should not serve them, or they should not have any authority over them. They challenged Jesus and said, should we pay the poll tax or not? And Jesus said, well, bring me a coin, 
And he said, well, whose likeness and in, in, in inscription is this? And they said, to Caesar's. So he said, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So what he meant by this is that we have to follow amount of authority that's given, because as we read in uh, Romans chapter 1 verse, or excuse me, Romans chapter 13 verse 1 through 7, that they were put there by God. And the godly attitude towards authority is to respect that authority. And sometimes it's hard to do that with the influences that we get in our society. In John chapter 19 and verse 11, you remember that Christ before Pilate, Pilate said, uh, don't you know that I have the authority to crucify you or to release you? And Jesus said, you would not have any authority over me unless it had been given you from heaven. Now, notice that Christ did not say, you know, I'm not going to do what you want me to do because I don't care. You have no rule over me. He, he, he did indeed say that Pilate had authority. Paul added to this, when he was before the Sanhedrin, I'm sorry, when he was before the Sanhedrin, Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin uh, on a trial, and uh, he said to the, one of the rulers, you whitewashed wall, and the leader of the Sanhedrin said to slap him. And so uh, Paul uh, said, uh, you whitewashed wall, and... One of the people said, do you speak that way about a ruler of your people? And Paul apologized, and he quoted Exodus 22, verse 8, which said that you shouldn't speak evil of a ruler of your people. So let's look at the political arena today and the, the police today. And how, do, how about you or me? Do we stack up in, in our attitude when it comes to scriptural view of how we view authority? Could you or I submit to a corrupt government official, someone who was an enemy of Christ, who conspired to have you, your friends, your family, your brothers, your sisters in Christ, falsely accused, thrown in jail, murdered, seizing your possessions, leaving you without a home or any means of support, which goes to Glenn's class this morning and the people that were in Smyrna. Imagine their attitude towards the people that were there in authority. What did they do? Did they riot? Did they pick up swords? What did they do? They submitted themselves to the authorities there, even to the point of going to an arena and being fed to wild animals or being burned at the stake. Could you, in such a state, when you were had a mishandling of just, uh, justice for yourself or your family, a, a gross miscarriage of justice for you and your family, what would be your attitude here in the United States about that? Do you think that you could apologize to the one that had done that to you and say, you know what, I'm sorry, you're a leader. I shouldn't have said those things to you. Could we do that? What about Christ? Here in his own country, arrested by his own people, turned over to invaders who, knowing he was innocent, beat him, condemned him to die, a prolonged death in humiliation, and he says to them, and he says to God, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And uh, he also taught in other places, Boy, I am lost. Anyway, he taught in other places, Matthew chapter 5, 41, if your enemy slaps you on the face, turn to him the other cheek. If your enemy thirsts, give him a drink. If an enemy uh, binds you to walk a mile, walk with him too. Now, I, uh, I know that if I don't like somebody or don't like somebody telling me what to do, uh, I'm really not going to be appreciative of them binding me to do something. Can you imagine if somebody who is an authority 
uh, got stopped along the side of the road and their car broke down and all of a sudden you were picked, a couple of people were picked, I need you to push this car to a gas station that's a mile away. Would you do that? That's what they had to do. What is, our, what is our attitude towards authority? Honestly, how would you react here in the United States? I think that we've been affected a lot more than we care to admit with the influences that are in our society today. Let's see how David acted in the face of authority that was against him for no reason. If you remember the story of the King Saul, who was anointed to be king, in other words, he had the authority. Uh, he disobeyed God, and an evil spirit was given to him to vex him. And so uh, he got jealous of David and uh, sought to kill David a couple of times. And what did David do? David ran. And no less than two times, David had the uh, ability to kill Saul, and he didn't. Because David understood that God had appointed Saul as a king, and that only God could remove him as the king. And let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 23, 1 through 4. Now, as we know, Christ means the anointed one, which is the Greek word chryso. It's interesting, the anointing also is chrisma, but uh, chryso is a Greek word, and it means the anointed, which means that he had authority. While Christ was on the earth, uh, in chapter 23 and verse 1 through 4, he was talking to the Pharisees, and, uh, or talking about the Pharisees, and he said the Pharisees had seated themselves on the seat of Moses, and he told the people that whatever the Pharisees tell you to do, do that, because they say to do it, but they don't. They bind heavy burdens upon men's back and won't lift them with a finger. But remember that Jesus, who had all authority, told the people, whatever the Pharisees tell you to do, do, because they had authority. And of course, we read also in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7, the same thing. In uh, Acts 4 and verse 18, there's something I need to bring up, and that is that even though there's worldly authorities that we should make sure that we uh, are in subjection to, that God's rule takes precedent over that, as was Peter said in, in, uh, in Acts 4, when he, they were before, the apostles and him were before the Sanhedrin council, and they, and they told Peter and them not to talk or not to speak in the name of Jesus. And you remember the story, Peter said, whether it's right in your sight or not, we're going to follow what God says for us to do we can because we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. Whether or not we have a problem with that, I don't know. I know that sometimes I do when I see things on TV or I, I hear things or things happen to me. There's been times some things have happened to me uh, that it wasn't really right, but we've got to guard our attitude when it comes to that. And I'm speaking not only to Christians, but for those who are outside the church, it's important to make sure that you don't let the influence of the world uh, paint your view towards the authority that's in God's word, because God has the final authority. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And through 20, Jesus said that he had all authority in heaven and on earth, and he told the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice that he did not leave out anything. He didn't say some of the things that I command you. He said all of the things that I command you. We should respect the authority of Christ first and the authority put in place both in the church and on the earth. But we should also always remember that bad company corrupts good morals. 
We can, if not careful, bring unscriptural attitudes into our beliefs which go directly against God's ordinances. This is counter attitude towards authority and is a device of the devil and a tactic he has employed to tear down the respect for authority in the world and, the, and, the, and uh, works to tear down the respect of God's authority in the church by rejecting his word and commandments. This is evidenced by the fact that many people and organizations that claim to be Christians are following God totally disregard his teachings and commandments. They add, they add uh, creed books. Uh, we, have, uh, we have LGBTQ uh, people that are supposedly Christians that are uh, women who are priests, uh, homosexuals that are priests, and they go about uh, saying that those things are okay. We have to be careful when it comes to the authority of the Scriptures. We cannot and should not allow outside influences to direct us in a way that's not right from what God has us to do. Although they understand, and we can read in the Scriptures, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, 1 through 5, there it is, Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 5, uh, we can understand when we read the scriptures. There's one, something that uh, happened to me, and I think I've told you before. Before I was a Christian, I wanted to know what God wanted me to do, and I read the Bible. And without anybody telling me what I needed to do, I understood what I needed to do. And I tried to baptize myself, immerse myself in water, because that's what I thought I needed to do to be saved. Like I said, nobody taught me. It was just me reading the scriptures. So I know that it can be done. I know that when people read the scriptures, they can understand what God wants them to do. It's the rejection of God's authority and rejection of clear teachings and doctrine in the scriptures that lead people outside. And I think there's a lot of evil influences that cause people to do that. People that do that... By their actions, they show they don't trust God or believe God, and therefore they don't respect his authority. And so they go out and establish their own religion based upon their own beliefs, which is exactly what's happening in the world when authority is rejected. In the church, authority uh, is God through Christ, the apostles by the Holy Spirit, the written word, and in the uh, autonomously in each congregation is the elders. When members uh, or outside people think they have a right or say so or a vote in all decisions or doctrines that we're supposed to obey, uh, become indignant when they don't get their way to a point of leaving the church or splitting the church, that's rejecting God's authority. The Holy Spirit has given testimony about those he has chosen to have authority in the church. In Acts 22, or excuse me, Acts 2 and verse 22, talks about how Jesus had the authority. Now, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he said that, uh, that Jesus was testified by God to have that authority by miracles and the things that he did, and also by God raising him from the dead. The apostles in, in Corinth, first, uh, excuse me, I didn't write 1 Corinthians, but I think it's 1 Corinthians. No, it's 2 second, second Corinthians, excuse me. Chapter 12 and verse 12, Paul said there that a, signs of a true apostle was shown in him and signs, wonders, and miracles. Men do not choose, but they can only acknowledge and recognize the Holy Spirit's testimony for authority and the doctrine that God wants us to follow. In the same way, the Holy Spirit gives testimony as to us as whether we are truly a child of God or not. We cannot choose how to become a child of God. That is written out in the scriptures. It is being led by the Spirit or following the, God's commandments and the doctrine by, by submitting to his authority. In Romans chapter 8, and verse 14 through 16, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of uh, slavery leading to fear again, 
For you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's not a wee small voice in the back of your head telling you that you're a child of God. That's the Holy Spirit through the Word of God telling you through his testimony, through the Word, that you have done what you need to do to be called the child of God. One of the things that we need to do is in Romans chapter 4 and verse 22 through 24. Believing in God and that Christ is the Son of God. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 8 and 9, confessing that Jesus is the Christ. In Acts chapter 3 and 19, repenting of the sins and turning away from transgressions and lawless deeds. Number, uh, the third thing, or the fourth thing is Acts chapter 238. As the first Christians did, they were baptized for the remission of their sins. And in Romans 8, 14, as I read, walk thereafter in faith, led by the Spirit. And these are the sons of God. That faith, written down for us, gives us testimony that we are God's children when we follow the commandments. For those who are not Christians outside the church, this is something that you need to understand and that the world may accept the fact that you can not follow authority or resist authority. But when it comes to God, who's perfect, when he's written down these things via the Holy Spirit, through his apostles, those are things that he expects us to do, and there's no questioning them. You cannot pick and choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. That's not the way it works with God's authority. God has said, these are the things you need to do. I don't want us to be um, unknowledgeable or make a mistake about the attacks on the authority and the outside influences that come and are seen in religious organizations and even in the church. These things are not done by accident, folks. If you haven't recognized it by now, if you're not old enough to recognize things, that the devil is real, and Satan has many devices. He's used them throughout history to try to gain influence among people in the church, people trying to follow God, because he does not want you to do that. And he'll use any means possible, whether it's torture and torment via uh, Glenn's lesson this morning, or subtle influences, subtle influences in the world that creep into your attitude and how you deal with things in the church or how you deal with your attitude towards God's word. These are subtle influences that the devil has made to get you away and have you not follow what God wants you to do. In uh, Colossians chapter 3 and 17, it says to do all in the name of Jesus Christ, whether in word or in deed. And there's a story in Matthew chapter 17 of verse 21 through 23 where Jesus is talking and he says, not everyone on that day when they stand before him in judgment, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out many demons? And he will say, go away from me. I never knew you, you who work lawlessness. Lawlessness. What does lawlessness mean? It means not following the authority, rejecting the authority that, that God has. When we are lawless and we reject God's authority, he's going to reject you if you stand before him and think you're okay. And that's what, the, that's what the really bad thing about evil influences can do. They can cost you your soul. This is a warning to Christians and a warning to those who are outside of the church. John said in 1 John chapter 2, 21 through 23, 
these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as he is anointed, but in his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie. And just as he has taught you, abide in him. Now, what does he mean, anointing? We talked about anointing is anointing kings, Jesus being the anointed one. What is he talking about anointing? And that is the word charisma. That's the Greek word charisma, like the anointing that Christ received was charisma, same word. So what does he mean by anointing? That means that God has placed on you, not only the Holy Spirit, through God's word, he has anointed you with the truth, and you have, no, you have no need for anybody to teach you anything. You already know it. But if you reject God's word as not being the authority, then you have no anointing. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away in shame at his coming. In 1 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21 now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who has this seal, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So God has, through his word, sealed us, anointed us with the Spirit as a promise if we abide in his word. I don't know where you are right now, and I don't, like I said before when I started, that um, you know, it's not the well who need a physician, it's the sick. So, uh, people who are outside the church who may be listening to me, I want you to understand that there are some influences that can happen to you outside in the world that may not affect you in a very good way, that can lead you away from authority or respecting authority enough to where you won't expect, you won't uh, appreciate and respect God's authority. And that would be a mistake. And then again, there's our Christian or Christian brothers who need to understand that we need to respect authority in the church, that we can't have it our way. This isn't McDonald's or Wendy's or Burger King. You can't have it your way. You've got to respect the authority of the scriptures of what it's written down here. So the elders have the, have the authority. And when they make decisions based upon their opinion, this has nothing to do with doctrine, and you don't like it, I'm sorry, that's kind of tough because they have the authority. And these days in the United States, we can say, you know what? I, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm going to go my own way and do my own thing. And that would be a mistake also because you're not respecting God's authority through the eldership, through the Holy Spirit who appointed them in. Like I said before, people, we need to not question God's authority through the Holy Spirit. We need to acknowledge what the Holy Spirit tells us when he tells us about his authority and the doctrine that we need to follow. I don't know where you are right now, but we're going to have a song in just a minute. And if you need the prayers of the church, or if you'd like to talk more about it, let us know as together we stand and sing.